Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another virtual edition of Encore Learning Presents. Uh, we're glad to have you with us on this uh, uh, wonderful uh, afternoon. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to enjoy uh, some of the nice weather. And today, uh, in fact, it is uh, it is about the weather. Uh, it's about climate change. And we, we've certainly uh, tackled this topic a number of times, but uh, this time it's a little bit different. It's kind of a call to action. It's what you can do to make a change, something more than just uh, uh, adjusting your, your thermostat. And we'll get into uh, introduction to the speaker in just a mo moment. Um, so with, with that, actually, what, the introduction this time is going to be a virtual introduction from former Arlington uh, board member, Jay Fassett. So bear with me while I uh, try to bring that up. Um, let's see. Oh. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today to uh, have been asked to introduce Andrea McJimsey um, for this Encore Learning Program. I'm so great, uh, happy that you all are continuing to look at the issue of climate change in uh, various ways. It's so, so important. Well, Andrea is somebody I've known for, oh, I'd say about 15 years now, and uh, she is passionate about climate and taking practical climate action uh, to address this issue. Um, first met her when she was involved in Loudoun County. Uh, she's from our region. She started and was the director of the campaign for Loudoun's future. And then from that um, was elected uh, to the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors. That's when we began working together very closely because she was a compatriot in terms of prioritizing climate, energy, environment issues for Loudoun County. She in fact was the champion of the first energy plan in Loudoun County. She worked diligently at the Regional Council of Governments, helping to develop the region's plan to address climate. Um, after leaving the county board there, um, she then at different had several jobs, but ended up working for Environment America as a senior director on global warming solutions. And the best news is that we got her back here in Northern Virginia because uh, the opening came up for the director, the executive director at the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions here in Northern Virginia, focused in Fairfax, uh, trying to advocate at the local level for climate solutions. And Andrea just took over that job last year. So she's back with all her passion, her wealth of knowledge, uh, and a real practical and insightful approach to addressing climate change. And so it's with all of that background, I think you're gonna have a great program. Um, please enjoy Andrea McJimsey. Andrea, take it, take it away. So I'll share my screen now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for taking this beautiful spring day to talk about an issue that I think is one of the most important uh, to ever face, our, our species. And um, I understand that you've had several sessions on this and that it's been pretty depressing. And I'm gonna be talking about that you really can do something about it. And it's critically important that we all lean in. Uh, so Jay just gave you a bit of my background, but I am a native of Northern Virginia. I grew up in Fairfax County in Springfield. And then I've lived in Loudoun County for the last, well, since 19, no, 2001. <laughs> and I was on the Board of Supervisors and um, I've been working on climate change for the last 21 years. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story. So I'm currently the executive director of this wonderful organization, Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Uh, we organize uh, faith members, people of faith, but I also want to say that we also work a lot with everyone, um, with everyone. And so it doesn't matter if you identify as a person of faith, we would love to work with you. So I'm going to, throughout this presentation, I'll be sprinkling in um, the work we're doing just because that's the work I'm doing now. And we'd love to work with you. And our mission is to organize the power of faith communities to advance solutions to the urgent moral challenge of climate change. And that's our website if you want to follow up with us. 
So why act to combat climate change? Um, I was 35 when I first heard about climate change. I was completely clueless. I'd never heard the phrase. Um, and I started dating my best friend's cousin who happened to be a climate scientist. So I like to say I went from zero to 100 miles per hour really fast because he was extremely worried. He was an expert on the Amazon forest. And um, anyway, I got involved. And um, it, I realized how critical this issue is to all of us, and especially future generations. And so I left the business world and became a kind of a full-time climate activist in one way or another. Uh, so for me, the science has always been the foundation of the work I do here. And um, just last week, a new report came out from the International Panel on Climate Change. And um, it's sobering. Basically, the message is that we need to get our act together in three years to avert the worst impacts of climate change. And I want to actually read what the IPCC chair had to say. This was at the press conference. The IPCC report before us today is powerful evidence that we have the potential to mitigate climate change. We are at a crossroads. This is the time for action. We have the tools and know-how required to limit warming and secure a livable future. The preceding IPCC reports are clear. Human-induced climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying. It is a threat to our well-being and all other species. It is a threat to the health of our entire planet. Any further delay in concerted global climate action will miss a rapidly closing window. This is the report that gives us options. It offers strategies to tackle the critical questions of our time. How can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? How can we sequester carbon? How can the buildings, transport, cities, agriculture, livestock, and energy sectors be more sustainable? This report also tells us the status of global emissions. It shows clearly that we are slipping from a trajectory to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So this report is a real call to action, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Oops, why is it moved? Okay, there we go. So um, experts on communicating climate change say that the most important thing that all of us can do is pretty simple, and that is talk about it. We need to talk about it with everybody. And um, I will tell you, I've been talking about it for the last 21 years. At first, people thought I kind of was weird. <laughs> um, but I ended up creating the space for a lot of people to also be able to start tackling this and talking about it. So even if it feels uncomfortable at times, it's important that we all start talking about it. And if you don't remember anything else from today's class, I want you to um, remember this, and you can Google Catherine Hayhoe, climate change, it's real, it's us, and this tweet comes up. Because this is what they say, the very simple message that we have to get across. Climate change, it's real, it's us, it's serious, and it's becoming dangerous, but there are solutions and there is hope. The science is clear, the faster we reduce our emissions, the less impacts there will be. Um, Catherine Hayhoe is a top climate scientist in the nation, and she's also an evangelical Christian, and she's now working with the Nature Conservancy in Arlington. Um, so anyway, she's, she's someone, by the way, to follow on Twitter, and we will talk about that soon. Okay, why for some reason? Sorry. Okay, so I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the negative because this is an important, the reason I'm telling you about this is for all of us, as you talk about this and as you tackle it, you need to be centered. I need to be centered in my story. And if I'm not, um, strange things happen, especially to me. Uh, this is where I used to live in Colorado. And this top circle is where my mother, who's elderly, and I had condos. This is the animal hospital where my uh, wonderful vet used to take care of my two cats. And this is where I used to um, shop at Costco. And um, we're gonna see Chuck E. Cheese's, which is right over, over in this area. And I'm gonna just play a part of a couple of videos 
uh, raw footage of what happened on December 30th of last year. I don't think we're seeing her anymore. And this is at Costco. Go east, yeah, towards Denver. Okay. Go towards Denver. Evacuate now. East, go. Evacuate. Okay. Everybody head east. Go towards 36. Move now. Leave your stuff. Go. The fire's out at the back. Go. Get out of the store now! When you get on the road, go eat. Ahí va, Bruce, pero no me tengo carro. No habla. Don't get the car. You don't have a car? No. Get in. I will. Back this side. Back door. That day. Over a thousand homes and multiple businesses burned to the ground. And this is what it looked like on New Year's Eve day in Louisville and Superior. So Climate change has gotten personal for me. I no longer talk about just the science and you know future generations. It's happening for people, our fellow Americans and our fellow humans around the world right now. Um, and one of the things that's so important as you're working on climate change to be centered in your story and in your why, even if you're not talking about it, it's really important um, because otherwise this is such tough stuff. It comes literally for me, leaking out my eyes. Um, and this is my father, Ben McJimsey, and his wonderful, my stepmother, Kathy, and then my two nephews, Chase and Ilya. And I've always had in my heart the children in my, in my life, especially Chase and Ilya. Um, but my elderly father, it just turns out that he lived next door to the town of Paradise, which burned down in 2018. Um, it's so close that he can bike to it. And um, I went through um, basically the deadliest um, wildfire in, um, in history of our country. 85 people died, worried sick about my father, and watching many other people worried sick about their relatives. Um, this is, uh, we went on our tour of paradise uh, a year later. This is the home, a former home of a good friend of ours. So we, we face a challenge um, of, of morally, what are we going to leave to our children and what are we gonna put them through now? And it's really easy to get discouraged. I believe there's just nothing we can do, but that's not true. And the whole rest of the class, we're gonna talk about how you can get involved. So I hope you have pen and paper and take notes. And I hope some of this inspires you and that you'll join with those of us that are working our hearts out on this issue. Okay, whoops. 
So ways you can be involved in climate change. This is just an overview. Uh, you can take personal actions. You can do all kinds of things in your house, energy efficiency, install solar, uh, read, um, get a heat pump. Um, you can work on your land. Uh, nature, plants, trees are natural carbon sinks. We can change our consumer behavior, what we buy, uh, reduce, reuse, um, recycle, and then um, also how we eat is incredibly important. Uh, then we can work with other people, including our congregations. This is a picture of solar panels on uh, a temple in Fairfax County, uh, the largest one in Virginia, um, and then their wonderful garden and they're teaching kids. Um, and then you can speak out for climate change. And it's incredibly important that we speak out for climate justice. One of the reasons I showed you the picture or the video from Costco was at the end, there was a woman who didn't speak English and she didn't have a car and she was in that terribly frightening situation. And I'm so glad that the uh, sheriff deputy was able to help her. But we need to watch out for the most vulnerable with little kids, the elderly, the disabled, um, immigrants, etc. I don't know why this is, I keep, my slides are not progressing well, but um, okay. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions now. I promise I don't have too many bulleted slides like this, but I'd like you to think about these questions as we're talking through the different actions and you can take. So for, first of all, where's their momentum in your life? Where's the energy? Uh, perhaps it's your kids or grandchildren that are talking to you about this. Maybe your faith community is getting really involved. Maybe your business is starting to, to take um, more sustainability actions. Um, and it's good to hook into that energy. And then what do you care about the most? And if it's not being dealt with, how can you get something started about what you care about? And what types of actions do you want to pursue? What, what's your skill set? What is your life experience? What is the power that you personally can bring to this movement? And then who do you know who would join you? Again, this gets back to talking about climate change. There might be people you don't think um, you know, care about it, but you might be surprised if you start talking to them because the research shows that uh, the large majority of Americans are starting to get really worried. And then how can we work together to support each other's initiatives? This is really important because uh, it's hard. This is, again, really hard work and we need to, to be there for each other. And then finally, let's put together a series of next steps, an action plan. Um, and I'm hoping that by the end of today, you'll actually have a series of things you wanna get going on. And it's really important to set those goals um, to stay focused. Okay, so step one, what is your story? Have you, like me, personally been impacted by climate change? Unfortunately, as the climate becomes more unstable, this is happening more and more. I saw a statistic the other day that a third of Americans have been impacted by a, nat a natural disaster. Um, and then if that hasn't happened, what fires you up in the press? Like for me, it's um, wildlife and um, what happens to pets in these, I really love animals and that really fires me up. Um, and what was the moment that you realized you wanted to get involved? And this could go back to your childhood when you perhaps played in the woods a lot or um, like, like I was, I was the girl with the frog in her pocket. I just loved wild animals when I was little. And that can be your story. And then what do you love? And by the way, this doesn't just have to be people. It could be, I love chocolate. I love wine, um, some coffee. These are all things that are being impacted by climate change. And if you can get centered in what your story is, I promise that you'll be more compelling and more authentic and more powerful. So I wanted to pause here and see if anybody had any questions or, or thoughts so far. Yeah, uh, Andrea, we, uh, we don't have any questions yet uh, in uh, the Q&A, but uh, certainly folks, as you're watching, uh, if anything comes to mind, uh, um, go ahead and uh, put it in the Q&A and we'll uh, pass it on to uh, Andrea. So, okay, go ahead. Okay, great. By the way, this is the beautiful Shenandoah countryside. So. And 
Another first step is to get educated, and there are just all kinds of great sources. Um, I want to caution that there really is a lot of misinformation, especially around this issue. So it's really important to identify reputable sources. So like um, the, the different government agencies that work on climate change, the EPA, the Department of Energy, those are reputable sources. Um, and then there's climate scientists, but I, I, I just, in the past, this seems to be kind of not happening anymore, but there were there have been some people that put themselves forward as scientists that really aren't, and you need to kind of just dig into that and make sure it's a reputable source. And then read books like Drawdown. Um, this is an excellent book. I actually didn't realize that food waste was such an amazingly important thing for us to solve in order to um, solve the climate crisis. So that's an excellent book. And then join organizations like the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Um, these organizations, depending on where they focus, like our focus is local, um, they will often be tracking things that are happening and you can find out you know, what important thing Fairfax County or Arlington County is doing and when the public hearing is and when's the opportunity for you to speak out. They'll do that work for you and you just have to sign up for, for email lists and there's some other ways to get more involved. Um, and then this one might sound weird, but climate change, climate experts and Twitter are really uh, um, like hand in love. It is a great place to go and follow climate experts. So for me, Twitter, I, I think of it as a highly curated news feed um, where I follow people like Michael Mann, who wrote the book on the right. I follow Catherine Hayhill. I, I follow NOAA and NASA and the people who measure, you know, all the different gases. And uh, like I said earlier, I, the IPC report, I didn't realize it was coming out and I saw it on Twitter that it had come out. And then study local and regional government initiatives. Usually in the press, we hear a lot about what's going on at the federal level, which is incredibly important. And then we also will hear about the state, but often you just don't hear much about the local and regional initiatives, but it's literally where the rubber hits the road and um, there's really important work going on. Uh, Andrea? Um, yeah. yeah, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we do have a question that probably um, is good to go ahead and tackle it. And and that is, uh, can you explain the role of food waste? Uh, uh, what, what role food waste has in climate change? So good. good okay, question. well, good whoever answer. asked that question was reading my mind <laughs> because this is what this um, this slide is about. I wanted to invite you. We're actually doing a webinar on food waste on April 18th from noon to 1 p.m. Um, as the Faith Alliance and the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. And uh, we have a partnership with Germany, uh, the Northern Virginia area does. And we're gonna be hearing about this wonderful case, Tafel is table in German. And we're gonna be hearing from the Germans about uh, food redistribution, which is an important thing for um, food waste as you know, to, to get the food from wherever it's being thrown out instead Brought, bringing it to people who are food insecure or can can use the food. So um, hopefully you can come to this. And by the way, we um, we record our webinars, and so we also have a YouTube channel. If you can't make this time, you could watch it there. Um, so I uh, and where I. I really encourage you to read Drawdown because it explains it better. Uh, and I'm just starting to learn about this 21 year, years into to working on climate change. But basically, it takes a lot of energy to grow food, to distribute it, to refrigerate it. Um, and it takes up a lot of land to grow it, um, which means less trees. So there's like so many different layers of how food waste impacts. And then if you're not composting and you're throwing your food into the trash, it actually um, creates methane and the um, uh, more methane in the um, landfills. So there's just so many layers to it. And it turns out that it's just incredibly impactful. So now, you know, I really, I live, I'm single and I, it's hard for me with food. You know, I often like, it's all, we get too 
big, like everything's packaged too big for a single person. So I'm working really, really hard myself to not waste food anymore. Um, and it's a challenge. Um, okay. I'm going to move on. Thank you for that question. Uh, Andrea, uh, this uh, yeah? just a question that popped up in my head. So I, I do a compost, um, but now, so does that not uh, produce uh, methane in the same way as if it went to a uh, landfill? Apparently it doesn't. And I think it has everything to do. And again, I am not an expert on this, but um, by the way, maybe we should do a webinar on comp composting and the science of it. But I know when you're composting in your backyard, uh, you've got the earthworms and it's just, it's all kind of being processed in a different way than just kind of rotting in the middle of a bunch of other junk. And um, what I will say is I know about methane that it's an incredibly powerful greenhouse gas. It doesn't last in the atmosphere nearly as long as long as CO2. CO2 lasts like a thousand years. And that's why we've got to concentrate on CO2. But methane is incredibly powerful. And there's so much being emitted at this point. Um, and it, it's um, much more powerful in a shorter time frame. So it's really important for tackling the climate challenge. Um, I hope that helped. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm going to, anything else, David? Uh, no, we're good for now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we do a uh, annual advocacy day workshop and this was January 13th of this year. And Steve Waltz, he used to be in charge of environment programs for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, which by the way, is how I got to know Jay so well. Um, he, he gave a presentation on what's going on locally. So this is just a couple months old. Um, so it's possible a little bit might be tweaked, but government doesn't work that fast. So this should be pretty accurate. Okay. So first of all, regional greenhouse gas emissions. The good news, the top line is 2005. The bottom line is 2018. And we've actually been cutting our greenhouse gas emissions, which is really fantastic. But honestly, we've tackled a lot of the easier things at this point, and we have a lot of hard work to get to the goals of the region. And here you can see on this chart that we're starting to stall out. Um, and we have a long way to go to get to the region's goals. I also want to point out this goal, 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. This is way too weak at this point. The science tells us that we need to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So the region really needs to redo that goal. But even so, we've got a long way and a lot of hard work to do. And you all can make a difference at the local level. Um, these are the climate risks that we're facing as a region. Uh, the two biggest ones for us are going to be extreme heat days. And as you all know, we're, we get a lot of humidity and you combine heat and humidity and it's very, very hard on humans, like high school football players, as an example. And then we're getting more and more flooding um, and both inland from water flooding. And then we're also starting to get, because we're tidal, we get coastal flooding. And then of course, these different things. One I want to point out, um, actually it's on another slide, hold on. Well, okay, energy equity. I just want to point out, I love this slide because it really makes the point that those um, in the lower income brackets have a much heavier burden. They pay for more of their their income goes towards energy. So if we can increase energy efficiency and things like that and reduce our burden, that's a very good thing for us to keep in mind. And there's an opportunity I'll tell you about a little bit later around that. Okay, um, this is a chart that shows the different wedges of the different opportunities we have to get to that goal. Um, which again is not, this is by the way, the 2030 intermediate goal, and these are not strong enough, but it's everything from renewable energy to um, zero, um, zero waste, all kinds of different things we can do, um, zero emission vehicles, et cetera. And this is a list of local climate actions that COG, um, the leaders have come up with. Um, so, you know, microgrids, more renewables, zero energy buildings, et cetera. 
I'm going to kind of fly through these, but hopefully you can go back and study these. And then these are the different jurisdictions in Virginia that make up uh, the council of governments. I want to just point out that Fairfax County, my home, you know, native county, finally um, has a climate action plan. It was passed just last year, so really pretty late to the game. Loudoun County was way ahead of most people. We, we got it done in 2009, um, but I will say they haven't updated it since, and it's been sitting a little bit on the shelf gathering dust, um, which is not good. Uh, so the whole region has a lot of work to do. Prince William, same, you know, they haven't done it since 2009. Um, I will say Montgomery County and Washington, D.C. are way ahead of Northern Virginia, and we have a lot of work to do to at least um, meet meet them at you know their leadership. Um, and then there's federal, state, and regional goals that are that all of our localities kind of can feed up into. I want to just say that we live in one of the wealthiest, most powerful parts of the country, really well educated. And I think we need to get to our goals faster because the, there's going to be other parts of the country where it's going to be a lot tougher. So we really need to show leadership. And to show that leadership, we need each and every one of you. I see there's a question, but I'm going to be done with this section really soon. Um, these are a class of impacts. Um, we've already talked about some of this. Um, one I want to point out, higher day and night temperatures. This is really important for human health. When it doesn't cool down at night, it's hard to just have it be hot all the time, especially for those who are elderly or little kids. Um, it's a really big health risk. And by the way, our next climate crisis forum is going to be talking about the impacts of climate change on children. It will be a very powerful presentation. Um, this is uh, from our advocacy day, our uh, slide on what's going on in Arlington County. We do have an Arlington County hub, and it would be wonderful if you all could join it and get up to date on what they're doing now to make a different uh, difference on these issues. I will say Arlington used to be a real leader, um, and they've stalled out a bit, and um, we want them to get back into leadership. Okay. Um, this is another thing we did at our advocacy day, which was an action alert for the incoming governor. Um, and I just want to pause here for a second. We have a partisan divide in our country about this issue, but it's starting to change. I want to say that. And we got to change it. We need to all be working on this together. We might not agree on all the policies and how to get there, but we've got to get past the silly divide we're in. And that, again, is only going to happen if people like you get engaged. Um, so our we, we in, uh, encourage people to write to the governor. And I want to just point out right from your heart, when you're earnest, when you're really centered in your story, it gets through to people. Elected officials are just real people like you and me. And I truly believe we can get through to some people who maybe aren't on the right path and, and turn them around. Uh, this is how one of the ways you can get in touch with Governor. This is his Twitter handle at Governor VA. You can also um, write him um, if you just Google contact the Governor of Virginia, it will come up and you should write to him regularly. That is my recommendation. Um, actually, I wanted to just say one more thing about that. Um, even if you disagree, like right now, I disagree with the Governor on quite a few of his actions. Um, uh, but he's in power. And so I am not giving up talking to him and trying to bring him to a path of really tackling the climate crisis. Okay. And then really get to know your elected officials. This is Senator Janet Howell and a couple of my board members and other people who have her constituents who have gotten to know her over time. Um, it really helps to get to know the elected officials. And there's all, way, all kinds of different ways you can do it. You can ask if you're a constituent, you can ask for a meeting. Um, you can go to their town halls and ask questions. You can go to different events where you know they're gonna be and go up and say hello and introduce yourself. Um, there's all kinds of ways, you know, maybe you live in their neighborhood. Um, it's really important for us to, to 
basically, especially I want to say when I was in office in Loudoun County working on climate change, it was very lonely. There was just one climate scientist who would come and talk and um, at our public hearings. And it was always so wonderful for me to see him. And I sure could have used a lot more friends. So even a climate champ and you're like, oh, I'm so glad she's doing the right thing. She needs to hear from you. Um, so, OK, I'll get off that. <laughs> my soapbox on that one. Um, and then this is the last part before we go to questions um, for an another section, um, testifying at public hearings. Um, so it might sound weird to put it with like getting to know your elected official, but if you think about it, at least at the local level, maybe you've never been to a public hearing, but all the elected officials are sitting there and there is nothing in between what you have to say in your mouth and, and their ears. Um, so even if they're doing their best to ignore you, which can happen sometimes, um, they're in the room with you listening to you. So um, unless you're just deathly afraid of, of public speaking, uh, this is really truly an excellent way to get to know your elected officials. And I wanted to just tell one story. There was one fellow I, I sat, I've sat through so many hours of public testimony. And there was one fellow who would come on a regular basis to talk to us about grass and letting grass grow higher. And I will tell you, every time I mow my grass and decide to actually mow it, I think about him and what he had to say. And I think I'm a better steward of our land because of him. So, um, I, oh, and one more thing. We do, by the way, a whole training on public hearings, um, but if you if you follow different groups that track local government, they're going to make you aware again of when you had that chance to speak up, or you can just keep an eye yourself on the on the county website. And by the way, county staff, if you're confused, just call the county and they're going to help you with this. Okay, questions or thoughts? Yes, we do have a question uh, from the audience. Stuart uh, is bringing up the. Um, um, potential issue of the Dillon rule as a potential obstacle. I know this is something you're probably very familiar with and you might want to just give a quick primer on the Dillon rule for, for those that may not be familiar with that particular um, yeah, construct. Yeah, so first of all, it's D-I-L-L-O-N rule. Uh, I think I got the spelling right, um, if, if you want to read about it. Um, and I call it the mother may I rule. Basically, localities have their hands tied to do a lot of things and a lot of things that are important to tackling climate change by the state. They basically can't do it unless the state gives them the permission to do it. Um, so as an example, uh, Fairfax County was interested in adopting stronger building codes because if you think about it in 2022, we should not be building stupid buildings that are wasting energy. Like that's we should build right in the first place. We understand climate change and we need to use energy more, more efficiently, so we should build right. But we were stopped because the, 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 we had to ask permission of the state. May, we, may Fairfax County adopt stronger rules? And the answer was no. I think Arlington County was part of that as well. Um, I hope that made sense. It's so hard to teach a class without being able to see everybody. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, just um, I'll do a follow up on the Dillon uh, rule. I mean, uh, yeah, I know Virginia is a is a so called Dillon state, but I don't know where that comes from. Is it in the state convention uh, or state constitution, or is it a just convention, or what? And is there a way to uh, make Virginia not a Dillon state? Okay, so this is a little pocket of ignorance for me, even though I've had my hands tied countless times by the Dillon rule. I don't, I've never tackled how to change that. And that might be a really good project for a few people in our really well-educated um, area to, to figure that out. I do know that there's other states like Nebraska's in the Dillon rule state. Um, and my guess is often what happens at the state level is somebody will come up with a way to stop something and they'll work it in multiple states. So I don't know if it's state law uh, and I apologize. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else knows and can put that in the Q and A. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, we do, but um, okay. That's uh, um, 
Interesting. Oh, um, well, we do have Stuart come back saying Arlington and Fairfax tried this year in the uh, 2022 session, but, but the bills failed. So evidently there is a legislative, a way to legislatively turn it around. Um, yes. uh, and uh, so- Yeah, David, basically it's bills that say, mother, may I, like, may we have the authority to, to have stronger building, to adopt stronger building codes, but we have to ask the state and the state has to pass that law. Right, right, right. Or they have to, well, yeah, here's Suzanne saying, can you explain the the, the Dillon rule? So maybe go ahead and uh, maybe more specifically exactly how that works when you're at the local level and the state comes in and somehow overrides you. Yeah, so so the, the status quo is that the locality can't do a lot of things like we're just not allowed to. And if we want to go and uh, be be ahead of the state, we have to ask the state permission. And uh, how do you ask the state permission? The General Assembly, the, the, um, the state senators and the state House of Delegates has to pass a law allowing that locality to do whatever they want to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know uh, one example, you know, in Arlington, um, we, we'd always had a uh, hotel tax, I think, or business tax, one of, no, a business tax to help on uh, local development, and the state disallowed it for a year or two, uh, and um, even though the, you know, businesses wanted it, because it was a development issue, I think that was just because the state was uh, um, upset that Arlington sued them over I-66 expansion, but that's just a uh, uh, example I'm somewhat familiar with as to how it can sometimes uh, play out. And so I want to actually, let me just say, this is a good example. So uh, tackling climate solutions is very complex. And uh, there's all kinds of kind of barriers that you're going to run into. And one of the most important things is to pick an issue and to really dig into it. And, and if it's a Dillon rule issue that, you know, is being stopped at the local level because of the state, become an expert on, um, in our case, we, we came up with, um, this was um, the chair of the, of, uh, the Faith Alliance came up with legislation, worked up with our friends at the Sierra Club, and we uh, got a state senator to um, take it on as one of her bills. And um, that's just an example of a group of people who are really worried about building codes, figured out that the barrier was the Dillon rule and put a piece of legislation together and then got a sponsor to carry it. And it went really far and hopefully, you know, we'll get it in the future. Um, but that's such a good example of like just picking whatever it is. Like I wanna do building codes and, you know, get that done in Northern Virginia. Uh, we could use help with that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, just to, not to belabor, but Linda um, uh, is giving a, I guess, a fairly concise uh, definition. It says the Dillon Rule is the principle that local governments, government can uh, only exercise powers expressly granted by the state or powers necessarily and fairly implied from the grant of power or powers crucial to the uh, existence of local government. Um, so I, that, that's, uh, um, <laughs> if, that, if that helps at all. But anyway, we can probably uh, yeah. move Otherwise, colloquially, mother, may I? <laughs> to right, the state. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see there's a whole bunch of questions and chats. Uh, yeah, some of them are just uh, the Dylan rule. So uh, people going back and forth. So I think, um, let me see if there's anything new. Um, um, let's see. Oh, uh, some, some of us uh, see. Stewart says Maryland follows international standards stricter than Virginia and Montgomery goes even further. It's not a strong Dillon rule, but a restricted state. So I, all of this is just commentary on the Dillon rule. So I think we can uh, we can move on at this point. Okay. And that might be a follow-up good class and like examples of things that are being blocked by the Dillon rule and get, get a lawyer or somebody who's really good on the legislative side of things to talk about it. Okay. Uh, great. Oops. 
Um, all right, so moving on to things you other things you can do. Um, one of my favorite things is writing opinion pieces. I've always liked doing it. I like to write and I have opinions. <laughs> I get really fired up about things. Sometimes I'll read an article and just be like, I can't believe that's happened. And I'll and I'll part of how I process it and deal with it is I write about it and I submit it to the paper. Um, so I've done it enough with the Washington Post and they like my writing that they've um invited me to write more often, and I do it as often as I can. Um, again, for me, I have to be pretty fired up about something to write. Often, um, it's easiest to get published if you've read an article and you react to it and you do it quickly. Time is really important. So if you find yourself reading something in the post or some other paper that really gets to you and you have something to say about it, do your best to carve out some time uh, that day or the next day to, to get your thoughts down and to send it in. Uh, it's also really important to know what the news outlet, um, what their rules are. So for example, the Washington Post requires exclusivity. A lot of the smaller papers you can have, um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide, but, um, and then often there's, uh, uh, word limits. So don't quote me on this, and it probably changes over the time, but I think for the National Washington Post paper to get on the big editorial page, it's 250 words, and to get into the local section is 750 words. I think that's right. But again, my point is that you actually want to go research and read whatever the paper's rules are for submission. Um, this is an example of uh, Virginia's work together on the climate crisis. This is me, you know, I'm fired up about we need to get past this partisan divide. Our governor was um, threatening to take us out of the greenhouse, regional greenhouse gas initiative, which has been a very successful program that has cut power plant pollution. And I happen to have worked on it for four years. And I happen to know that there are Republican governors that are very supportive of it's uh, called REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So, you know, I thought that was a good argument, hopefully to change the heart of our governor. Um, so that's what I read about. And then this one is something I'm so fired up about. Um, I live exactly one mile from the new Ashburn Metro stop. And if I tried to walk or bicycle there from my neighborhood, I would probably die because uh, there's um, a couple of the 11 most dangerous intersections in Latin County are a mile from Metro. And for whatever reason, the leaders have not made that a priority. I've even talked, I talked to Governor Northam about that issue. So um, basically, if you're fired up about a climate solution, one of the best things you can do is get it into the paper. And by the way, VDOT actually called me up and met with me and did a walking tour with me after I wrote this piece. Probably helps that I'm a former elected official, but um, and then uh, your local papers matter too, and they're always looking for content. And elected officials pay attention to all of these uh, ed editorial comments from their, uh, and by the way, commenting on, on uh, articles matters too. I didn't put that in here. This is a piece that I just love, um, that I really resonated with. This young man basically said, uh, we're, the schedules of buses and trains are so not aligned that you can literally, you know, watch your bus take, taking off and be stuck. This used to happen to me. I'd be stuck in the cold waiting in the dark cold for half an hour, having watched my bus just uh, right away when I got off the train. So um, anyway, that's a good example. Whoops. And then I forget what the other one is. Oh, I know. I wanted to tell you that's um, a group of MIT alumni that I work with nationally. We write letters together on a regular basis. We get about one a month. And then a bunch of us get it, um, get them into papers across the country. So the one that I had up there uh, actually was like in Kentucky, got, um, which I think is really good. And that's an example of you can write something and then give it to other people and they get it out across the country. So um, it's a way to basically spread your power. Okay, and then work with your local reporters, um, especially in this area. Uh, we have some really excellent local reporters. This fellow, Michael Morrow, actually just went to work for a national paper because he's so good. 
Uh, but he, at the time he was writing for the Fairfax County Times. And he was writing about a forum that we did, the Climate Crisis Forum that we hold annually. Uh, he spent an hour on the phone with me. And it turns out he's just super fired up about climate solutions. Um, and there's a few things about this slide that I want to point out. First of all, it's really good to have good visuals. The press loves good visuals. So we had done a um, photo petition to encourage the board. You, you saw it actually in the advertisement for this um, talk uh, about basically be bold on climate change. And here they had the kids actually made their posters and they presented it at church. And this is Pastor Rob Erickson from Heritage Presbyterian Church in the Mount Vernon area. Um, so anyway, there's like all kinds of goodness here. And this went to lots of households around the county and I'm sure elected officials took note. So don't forget about your local papers. And then the internet. <laughs> um, so it's really important to get involved on social media. And I know that a lot of people are turned off by the various big big companies at this point for various reasons. But I really want to encourage you to get back in there. My favorite medium is Twitter. And I want to tell you a few stories about it. First of all, this picture. Uh, this was a photo petition that we did, you know, like a bunch of us did. And this is me on my back. I, I drew this on the back of a cardboard box. And I tagged a bunch of the different supervisors in Fairfax County, including Chairman Jeff McKay. And I had only been at the Faith Alliance for a month when this happened. He tweeted back, uh, and I am absolutely certain this was him personally. And he, I just want to point out, he promised aggressive implementation of the Climate Action Plan. This is the community-wide community, community -wide energy and climate action plan is what CCAP stands for. So I basically managed to get the chair of the county on the record because um, Twitter is a record, public record, um, that he was going to support aggressive implementation, which was very, very encouraging. Um, so that's one of the things you can really build relationships with elected officials. There's another fellow that I tag a lot. He's my state senator. And I kind of felt like it was just going into the dark hole because I never heard back from him. And then all of a sudden he responded for um, something about styrofoam, um, polystyrene, um, and that well, anyway, there was something bad going. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But um, my point is that elected officials often pay attention personally to their Twitter accounts. It's not just their staff. Um, and then the other thing is you can really get to know people. Like I became um, kind of friends with Michael Mann, one of the top, top um, climate scientists in the nation via Twitter. That's how I built access and friendship with him. And we ended up co-authoring an op-ed together that was in The Hill, which is a big national publication, which was really cool. So um, there's a lot of tricks about Twitter. Uh, we could spend, again, an entire class on this. And by the way, I want to just say, I have put in a grant to do a boot camp of classes to how to be a powerful climate advocate. Uh, if I get it, I hope many of you will come back and we can dive way deeper and get really hands-on with some of the things. I'm just giving you super top line, different things you can do. Okay, then be a grass roots and a grass tops organizer. Um, what that means basically grass tops, that's like the metaphor of grass, um, is people like your pastor or maybe the CEO of a company or someone who has kind of uh, larger influence on larger parts of our community. And then there's you and me, you know, like grassroots, like just the people, your neighbors, maybe the, your fellow um, parishioners and your at your church. Uh, maybe it's the soccer, the soccer moms that you can hang out with. Um, if you tell people about what's going on and get them involved, that's grassroots. And so there's all kinds, there are so many tactics you can do. Again, we could spend a whole class on this, um, but really recommend basically leveraging your circles of influence. So uh, for example, for me, this is a bunch of my um, board members, um, and they're obviously a part of my circle of influence right now. Um, this is Reverend Dr. Jean Wright. 
Uh, it turns out we've been wanting to start a Loudoun County hub because we really need a lot more climate action in Loudoun County. And she's moving to Ashby Pond and we're gonna be starting a hub together, which I'm super excited about. Um, and then this is another example. This is Bill Pugh who um, works for the Coalition for Smarter Growth and he is the hub leader for our Alexandria hub. And he called me up and said, do you know anybody who could give a talk on environmental justice? I really wanna do a webinar. And I knew Reverend Michael Malcolm and brought him in and we had this fabulous discussion in Northern Virginia. So basically think through your network and there's probably all kinds of cool people you know that you could bring to help us build climate power. And people pretty much always say yes when I, when I call them up, by the way. So uh, people are hungry to help. So let's pause. By the way, this is one of my favorite trees in Loudoun County, which recently died. And I think because of climate change, but anyway. We get to see its beautiful trunk. So questions or thoughts? Yeah, there is a thought uh, from uh, Suzanne, uh, uh, kind of going back to the uh, the concern about waste causing a problem with climate change. And she notes that, you know, there are some restaurants that instead of throwing uh, the, the, the wasted food out that they uh, provided to organizations that distributed to uh, homeless or underprivileged people, uh, which sounds like a great idea. And we can, you know, I guess encourage uh, restaurants to do that or inquire when we go to a restaurant. And she also notes that there's some uh, um, uh, municipalities or large cities, I guess, in the Northwest California that um, um, require, I guess, uh, that you compost your waste or I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but mm -hmm. she was saying, you know, uh, absent that, what, what uh, alternatives uh, would work? Um, do we have yeah well let me let me talk about both of those things first of all um my pastor who i grew up with in springfield virginia um and by the way in a very conservative lutheran church that he's like my dad and i've always stayed part of this church because of my pastor and he um is such a wonderful person he he worked with panera our local panera bread um uh, Panera, is that what it's called? Anyway, Panera. Um, and every Sunday we would have their leftover bread. And so people in our church who were maybe food insecure would take would take what they wanted and then we would bring it um, to the um, food pantry. Uh, so that's often, um, if you're interested in getting involved with something like that, often faith communities are already doing work like that and they always need volunteers. Um, there's also some really cool apps. I can't remember. I actually have it on my phone. If I had, if I had a moment, I would find it for you. But there's actually apps now where if a restaurant has food left over towards the end of the night, you can get really good deals on the food. Um, unfortunately, when I, I downloaded it, I'm way out in Ashburn and it was like, uh, restaurants in Tyson's, and I'm not going to drive all the way to Tyson's for a good deal, but um, check that out. And I'll try, if I can, to find it on my phone. Um, and then the other point was compost. So when I lived out in Boulder County, which is uh, where that horrible fire happened in December. Anyway, they they do great work on climate solutions, and they um, have composting. And I've actually toured the um, big compost site. It's like really cool. It's all these basically piles of dirt. And um, they also, you might see like stuff that looks like plastic, but if you look co closely, it says compostable. Um, but that kind of, it needs to be industrial. It has to, it's industrial composting. And I think it needs to go into a certain kind of system. And you can't just like throw it into your backyard compost pile. Um, so there's all kinds of, this is another area of like all kinds of layers of solutions and we don't do it here. And it's a problem like, um, I'm actually afraid I compost in my backyard and I'm about to have an HOA inspection and I'm worried that my compost pile is going to be a problem. We'll see. I'll have a fight with them if I need to. But, um, you know, there can be HOA regulations. There's lots of people don't understand composting. So they might think it's going to bring in, you know, rats or so there's public education about it. Um, and then there's different 
municipality rules around it. And so if you live, for instance, in an apartment building, you don't have a backyard to compost. And um, so some municipalities like Boulder County uh, actually gather the compost. So another great example, if this is something that interests you, let's make it happen in Northern Virginia. And I don't know all the solutions and all the ins and outs of how to do it, but that would be a great thing to lean into. So. Yeah, yeah, and I'll just note, um, probably people that are on this call that are in Arlington are aware of the green green bins that uh, have been in existence for a while uh, for yard waste. Uh, people also could put their compost, uh, compost material in there uh, as well. Oh, and, that's great. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and they, they did issue everyone little, little smaller bins or uh, package that you can actually uh, put in your kitchen to, to to, you know, to accumulate it. Um, and I also, um, by the way, just need to um, mention vermiculture, which is the worms eat my trash. <laughs> I love, I used to have worms and they're awesome. And I, I'm kind of an expert on that if anyone's interested. Okay. Uh, let's see. It looks like uh, Dolores mentions that, that moms on Lee Highway, that they, they uh, take uh, food or send their food scraps uh, for composting. So um, I mean, that doesn't surprise me given that uh, the, the nature of that uh, organization. And um, also Elizabeth writes that Fairfax County is running a, a composting pilot. Uh, and um, I guess to uh, explain to people how to, uh, um, how to do the composting. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. So I guess she's asking, are there, do you have, have any suggestions for learning more about uh, backyard uh, composting? Well, that's an example of something I'd like to do a webinar on and get some local experts. And by the way, I just want to say this is also an example from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, like maybe Arlington's doing it right and Fairfax County could learn from it. Or, you know, I know Loudoun has a lot to learn that we have a lot of rural land, but, um, you know, there's, this is like, if we lean in kind of as a region, we can um, figure out best practices and share them. And um, as, a, as you can see, I'm a former elected official who was a climate champ. There's so much I still don't know. And so that's what you can do for elected officials, especially you have to put policies into place. You can basically lay it out for them and give it to them and then they can run with it. They have the power and the access to run with it, but they just, you know, they're just one person and often have very small staff. Um, so that's one way to think about really uh, with elected officials um, laying this out for them. You know, these are the issues, this would be the good policy, these are the talking points, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, um, uh, Vivian, who is our Encore Learning um, uh, uh, um, help uh, here on this, uh, noted that uh, um, the the app, I, Good to Go app, is I think uh, for uh, when you you want is, is that is that the one I guess uh, I think that's the one. It's yeah. called Too Good to Go, and it's free. Oh, Too that's Good it. to Go. Too, too good, good to go. go, and it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you, Vivian. Yeah. 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 Uh, and now, um, Stuart is asking about the uh, compostable bags from the grocery store. That Do, do they work or not always? I, I guess, I think because, Andre, you mentioned some of them about some of, some things need to be done in uh, composted industrial. So maybe you can clarify what, what things you can do yourself and what you need to be done on an industrial basis. Yeah. So um, the way I would think of it is if it's organic matter, um, and it's got to be the right kind of organic matter. You don't want to put like chicken bones in, uh, but you can put eggshells in your compost. Um, basically, um, if it's plasticky looking, that's probably the industrial composting and needs to be processed in a different way than just a compost pile. Um, Again, I am not an expert on this. I just know a bit from having run, I ran a National Historic Landmark in Boulder County and had to know some of this. Um, so I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. Uh, but we should probably, the, this is clearly an interesting um, topic that maybe we could get some experts like from Boulder County about you know, how they deal with this and what we could bring to our, our jurisdictions. Yeah, and uh, Barbara uh, knows that Falls Church has a community, uh, community 
composting where you can bring your home composting there and 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 also Stuart's asking about I think what type of food waste but it may vary so you might want to just check depending on on the program that's uh that that is that that you're uh, engaged in yeah yeah and let me tell you I there's an opportunity we're actually looking for volunteers so those of you who are really interested in this uh, apparently they're starting to do composting at farmer's markets where you can bring your compost and we need volunteers to look at whatever people are bringing and teach people like chicken bones, not a good idea, eggshells, that's okay. And basically making sure we keep contaminants out of the, the composting stream. So there's actually a real life volunteer opportunity right now where you could help um, educate the community. So I know it's happening in farmer's markets somewhere in Northern Virginia. <laughs> and I can connect you with those people. Yeah, and uh, Mary just points out that uh, bones are okay for artisan and co composting. So just uh, let people know that. And kind of moving on from composting, but similar, uh, and that Linda wonders is, is styrofoam being phased out? Uh, it seems as though it's been in rest, uh, uh, or some restaurants are providing paper boxes now for leftovers versus styrofoam. So where, where does that stand? Maybe it's state by state. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, I know enough to be dangerous. So, but um, I know enough to point you in the right direction. So there was a ban on styrofoam passed in Virginia, uh, but I believe it was a five-year phase in. So it was basically giving restaurants, um, you know, they probably have a bunch of styrofoam that they've, that they've, ordered and basically to use up the styrofoam maybe was the thought. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but that's what got passed. And then uh, I know that in this general assembly, uh, they were trying to get into the budget uh, delay of that. And I don't actually know where that ended up. That's what my senator was tweeting back at me. And I need to tweet at him again and say, what happened with the styrofoam? Um, but that's a really good example of a very live issue that it would help to have a lot more voices from different jurisdictions pushing on. Um, and sorry, I don't know exactly where that landed. Yeah, we're getting all kinds of great information uh, coming from the audience. Uh, and uh, I guess someone says, uh, it's interesting, eggshells should not be put in the garbage disposal because um, they cling to the side of the pipes. But uh, uh, they're actually, I think, also they're good for your garden. You can just uh, <laughs> crush them up and put them right in your garden soil. But that's um, another topic for gardening, I guess. So, and okay. by the way, I might be a little wrong on compost stuff because I did the vermiculture, so I might be like switching over some rules from one to the other. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, so I tell you what. Let's um, before we uh, move on. Well, we we cleared the questions, but. Uh, let me um, just let people know about upcoming um, events. Or do you have more in your slides? Andrea? I do have a little more. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I, I, why don't you go ahead with your slides? I can. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we're going into the last section. Okay. It's okay. the important section. Okay. So first of all, know your issues and have a strategy to win. So for example, on the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors, there's nine votes. You need to get five to win. Um, some you need, so you need to know the numbers of people and you need to know uh, if anybody is recusing themselves. This is an issue that I am, uh, like I'm very fired up about. They want to put, uh, proposing to put data centers right on the border of Manassas National Battlefield, as well as Prince William National Park, Prince William Forest. Um, and if anybody's interested in this, I'd love to tell you more. Uh, there's great letters from the National Park Service, from Fairfax Water, from Fairfax County, because this would have a big impact on the Occoquan watershed and the drinking water of 800,000 people. Um, and we should, in my opinion, not be cutting down forests for these giant buildings that have huge impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. And these companies are wealthy and should be able to just put them in industrial areas where they belong. This is an example, it's very complex what's going on and you really, really wanna do your research and you wanna to go to reputable sources. Um, and then, uh, by the way, this is the visual, that's where they wanna build right next to the battlefield. Um, so 
that's just an example of something I'm working on right now. And then we need to make climate change a top priority issue. And what I mean by that is for elected officials, they need to know that it's a top priority for voters. So this is what, um, this is the Yale and George Mason University research on public opinion. It shows that Americans are really pretty worried about this issue. But when you look at voting issues, it still is not getting up to the top. And um, that gets back to talking about it and also really getting to know your elected officials and just keep elevating this issue. Because honestly, if we don't fix this issue, a lot of issues aren't gonna matter. Um, uh, so we've, we've got to elevate this issue. Okay, and that means speaking out uh, everywhere you can. Um, okay. And then this was from An Inconvenient Truth. In 2006, at the end of Al Gore's movie, it actually had in white letters on a black screen, if your elected officials aren't doing the right thing, run for office yourself. And so in 2007, I ended up running for office myself. This is me, and there's Jay. <laughs> so, um, okay, whoops. So examples of how you can get more involved. I'm just gonna popcorn some ideas. This is, you can staff a farmer's market compost station. This is what I was talking about, educating donors about composting. You could table with my organization at Green Expo events to get the word out about climate solutions. You could join a green team at your faith community, or if they don't have a green team, you could form one because I bet there'd be other interested people. Uh, we have advocacy teams, literally in every district in Fairfax County, we have a team of people that have gotten to know their supervisor. It's very, very powerful. And then we also have issue teams, like a transportation team that's working on things like electric buses. Um, work with your neighborhood to plant more native trees. I'm working on this with Audubon Natural Society and my own HOA. And trees are carbon sinks. They're important. And they're also important to wildlife. Um, and then we have a transit core. Uh, I'm not going to, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to tell you all of this, but here's another one. Cook a vegan dish for your next potluck. Um, I have my go-to doll, refried doll is delicious, um, that I always try to bring. And then Energy Masters, I'm sure many of you know about this in Arlington. We're actually working with Energy Masters on, um, getting more energy efficiency, um, in homes for people with, uh, mental disabilities. Um, so we would love to have some more volunteers on, for those programs. And then finally, we need to take care of each other. This is a really, really hard issue. I mean, I'll be frank, I cry when, I, I was crying when I was watching those videos. It's very hard what's going on and, and we need to take care of each other. We have a climate chaplaincy program where we're um, working with pastors and rabbis and other faith leaders to, um, basically figure out how we can take care of each other better. Make sure you have fun. These are some of my friends um, in the climate movement and make sure that you celebrate, especially when there's a win. People often forget the celebration. And this is another thing we're working on. We have several psychotherapists who work with us um, around active hope. Um, and you really, I just wanna emphasize, this is hard stuff and you need to take care of yourself and. Um, I hope you'll join with us in this. Okay, oops. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to say a couple things about nature and nurturing yourself. I uh, had a wise older woman give me this poem when I was young and I want to read it to you or it's not really, it's more of a statement. Be as I am, a reluctant enthusiast, a part-time crusader, a half-hearted fanatic, Save the other half of yourselves and your lives for pleasure and adventure. It's not enough to fight for the land. It's even more important to enjoy it. And I've just seen climate activists after climate activists get so busy that they start to burn out. So I just wanted to share this with you and encourage you to stick it up on your refrigerator. And then finally, I want to end with this wonderful poem by Wendell Berry. Um, if you're not a visual person, I invite you to just close your eyes. This is him reading his poem. It's short and it's very meaningful to me. The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound 
in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. That poem, whoops, stop, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> that poem's really helped me. Um, I just wanted to share, this is the Faith Alliance coordinates if you want to get involved with us. Again, you don't have to identify as a member of the faith community to work with us. We'd love to work with everybody. And then finally, I'd love to stay in touch. This is my personal Twitter handle, and this is my professional email, and I hope to hear from all of you. Okay, great. Well, uh, I'll leave that up for um, a little while if people want to uh, jot down that information. And also, Elizabeth, uh, uh, mentioned that the uh, you can go to the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District uh, to get grants to plant native landscaping at uh, HOAs. So, and I don't know, is that, I guess, uh, is, um, Andrea, is that planting native plants, is that an um, uh, important factor in climate change or just planting in general? Yes, it's so important. Native plants, survive better because they're native. Uh, invasive species, invasive plants are so bad for wildlife. They crowd out other, other important native species. I, it's so important. And plants in general, they are carbon sinks. So that is a very, very important part of climate solutions. And it's incredibly important for the other species, the, the other animals and creatures that we are on this planet with, um, and they, they've got a rough life and climate change is making it rougher and we need to give them as much goodness as we can. Like planting an oak tree is incredibly important. And I just wanna, I wanna lift up Audubon Naturalist Society and their Green Your Own Neighborhood program, um, which will put you in touch with all kinds of resources to help get those trees planted in your neighborhood. So thank you for lifting that up. That's so important. Um, I mean, we are, we are, well, we have about 10 more minutes if anyone has any additional questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, Andrea, I mean, if there's any other information that you think uh, is um, important for people to have on, on this topic, uh, go ahead. We have a, let's see, we do have a question. Um, oh, just something appreciating your, uh, uh, the knowledge you've bestowed on us uh, today. So, uh, yeah, okay. Um, well. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so un unless there's another uh, um, aspect you want to cover, uh, we can uh, just kind of uh, move to close things out. Uh, um, I can give you the last word, Andrea. Well, I just want to say thank you for, for letting me speak with you today. And I hope you got some inspiration for some things you could get involved with. And my, I guess my last thing I'll just say is just start where you are and you really can make a difference. Um, I really believe in the butterfly effect, you know, just the flap of a butterfly can change the world and you doing whatever your heart's passion is to help solve the climate crisis can really make a difference. And um, thanks for letting me spend this time with you. Yeah, yeah. well, thank you for uh, presenting all this great information and it certainly, um, I think adds a ray of, of hope that we can make a difference and uh, presenting, uh, you know, I mean, our elected officials are often more available than we realize. And that is what can, we can really leverage, I think our voice if we uh, move them to, to, take, to take action. Um, uh, just uh, some other uh, um, appreciation coming in through the Q and A. Appreciate everyone coming and we'll, we'll see you next month. So Andrea, uh, again, thank you very much for, for uh, coming on and giving us this great information. So, thank you. Okay. Take care, everyone.